for us, what we do, it's a peer to peer. Uh, so we're able to come from a position of experience uh, and personal testimony and say, Hey, I've been here before. I've, I may not have ex the same ex exact experience as you, but I've, I've, I've been where you are. I've struggled and I found a way forward. Let me show you how. Hello and welcome to the Mighty Oaks Show today. Glad to have you with us. Looking forward to a wonderful conversation. My name is Jeremy Stallnecker here with Chad Robichaud. Uh, I say here, it's virtually here because that's the world we live in now, but virtually here with Chad Robichaud. And uh, we're going to answer some questions for you today. But before we jump into that, again, thank you for watching. If you're watching, for those of you that are on YouTube, make sure you subscribe, hit the notification bell. That would be awesome. Leave us a comment, send this content out, and uh, we look forward to communicating with you there. For those of you that are listening, perhaps listening via a podcast platform, make sure you sign up on that podcast platform so that you get all of this content when it comes out. But take some time, go over to YouTube, look for the Mighty Oaks Foundation, and uh, subscribe there. You'll get a lot of other content. And for those of you over at Mojo, 5.0, again, same thing. Thank you for listening. Uh, so thankful for our relationship with Mojo and for all that's happening there. Uh, but I would encourage you, we've got so much other content that we produce and we're constantly producing content. And we do it for one reason, that's for you and for those that you know that might be helped by it. And as we come into today's show, really that's our goal with the show today is to answer some questions that we get asked. And uh, you know, we travel, we speak to folks, we get emails and texts and instant messages, <laughs> and um, folks are asking questions all of the time uh, about the Mighty Oaks Foundation. What do you do? How do you do it? Questions like that. Um, more specifically, we'll be asked questions about post-traumatic stress and trauma and how to deal with those either as an individual struggling or as a family. So many other questions, and we wanted to take some time today and work through some of them. We won't get through all of them, but I think this is something that we'll do a little more regularly. Um, folks, submit questions. And again, if you're at YouTube, uh, you can do that. Submit some questions and we'll get those on the next round. Uh, but people are always asking these questions. We have them. We're compiling a list and we want to jump into that. Um, but before we do, Chad, glad to have you on the Mighty Oaks show. It's really your yeah. show, but it's nice to have you here. Um, <laughs> Well, it's, uh, I'm, I'm catching you virtually, but um, and then after I get done recording this, I'm getting on a plane and right. flying over to you. <laughs> and we're going to do some more recording this week. Yeah. Um, we've been recording a lot. One of the things that we do in addition to this show is something called the Situation Report. And uh, that's been a great uh, radio show for us on a different platform. It's been, been fantastic, but we'll record a bunch of that this week. But you're also doing a couple of other events this week. I don't know if you want to touch on those before we jump into these questions. Yeah, I mean, it goes right into the question of what we do at Mighty Oaks. One of the things that I do a lot of is resiliency events and uh, go out and speak to uh, our active duty military warriors about resiliency, uh, suicide prevention, uh, spiritual resiliency, combat readiness, all the things that we believe that, you know, prepare our warriors to be the most uh, combat ready and resilient warriors that it can be to do the jobs they do and service our country. Uh, being physically tough, mentally tough, right. have a strong spiritual foundation, uh, socially being surrounded by the right people. So we just like to go out and, and speak into that on the front end of their service so we can prevent them from some of the problems that we see on the back end of service, such as suicide, post-traumatic stress disorder, divorces, things like that. Yeah. So it's one of my favorite things to do in the organization. So I'll be, uh, you know, like I said, a few minutes here, heading to the airport, getting on a plane, uh, I'm doing several events. Uh, tomorrow I'll be speaking uh, to all the Marine Corps recruiters on the West Coast of the United States. And I have a big conference uh, once a year. And so I'll be speaking there, sharing uh, my story, sharing what we do at Mighty Oaks, and giving some lessons on, on resiliency. A lot. Uh, being a recruiter in the Marine Corps is, is a tough job. I mean, one, they, you know, most of the guys that are recruiters have been in the Marine Corps a while with a lot of peer support being in big units and then they get pulled out in a kind of an individual duty assignment working by themselves, very long hours, yeah. uh, high, like a high expectation. Uh, so the workload's just really hard and they just have timelines to meet and, and quotas to, to meet and dealing with snotty nose kids <laughs> <laughs> in high school every day. And, yeah. and, uh, you know, so, um, yeah, so it's a, it's a tough job, a lot of stress. So I'm just, uh, you know, praying that I can go to speak positive uh, insights and then 
uh, as they continue to do a job and and, uh, and bring you know the very best of our nation into the United States Marine Corps. And then uh, then on Saturday I'll be over at Marine Corps boot camp and I'm speaking to two groups. The first group I'm speaking to is some of the Marine Corps drill instructors, uh, which is you know, another very difficult job, high stress job. And, uh, you know, and they have a, such a big responsibility to prepare our next generation Marines and make, make Marines. And then I'm speaking to the, uh, MRP, which is the, uh, medical, um, the medical, like medically injured recruits who are sitting there in holding patterns, which yeah. really sucks for a young kid going to boot camp. You think you're going to get out of there in, uh, in, 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 uh, 13 or 14, 15 weeks right now, you think you get out of there in 15 weeks, but you get a shin splint, spring your ankle, yeah, right. something silly. And now you're stuck there for months. So those kids are, uh, you know, they need uplifting and motivation. So I'll be excited to speak to them. And Sunday morning, I'll be speaking to the masses of recruits. Uh, I don't know what the number is this time. It's usually sometime between two and 5,000 recruits. And I'll speak to them on, on spiritual resiliency. And it's probably, uh, I've been doing that for five years now, uh, going to every quarter there. And it's probably one of my favorite things to do at Mighty Oaks. I mean, there's a lot of great things we do at Mighty Oaks, but for right. me, it's just such a, you know, it's just very rewarding, very satisfying. You and I wrote that book, uh, Path to Resiliency, and the Marine Corps lets me give that out to the recruits right. there. And, and uh, we've given out, you know, thousands, you know, over probably, probably 100,000 of those those books yeah. alone. And, uh, and you know, I see, I see guys in the fleet and they like, hey, I read that book, you know, <laughs> I, I went, when I was at boot camp and it really helped me out. So, yeah, it's just very rewarding. I, I love doing it. So I'm really looking forward to, the, to this week. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, when we talk about resiliency and, you know, you use that word, I use that word. As you mentioned, we wrote a little book on it. Uh, I say little book. I, I don't mean it's not significant, but it's small. It's a small book. <laughs> um, resiliency is something I think is misunderstood, and that's a question we do get asked a lot is, what does it mean to be resilient? What is resiliency? It's a word that gets tossed around a lot in a lot of different contexts. When you talk about resiliency uh, and being resilient, what does that what does that mean to you? What are you trying to communicate when you go and talk about this to folks? I think it's the preemptive act of preparing yourself to be able to endure a hardship or be able to bounce back from a hardship. So it's uh, being resilient is making decisions in advance, uh, or maybe even being intentional about training in advance to prepare yourself for the hardships that you know are going to come. Right. Now, when those hardships come, you're either able to one endure them, or b uh, one or two, a, a or b, right? <laughs> either a endure them or or b be able to bounce back from them. That's yeah. being resilient. And uh, yeah, it's it, it's important to, to talk about that too because I think some people think that to be resilient means you're avoiding friction or avoiding pain or avoiding traumas or whatever. Um, that's not it at all. In fact, it's acknowledging that those things will come into your life and then preparing, as you mentioned, ahead of time to deal with them in, in a positive way and to continue moving forward after it happens. It also doesn't mean you're not going to – being resilient also doesn't mean you're not going to stumble, that you're not going to fall in your face. Um, I mean, I'll go to my B, being able to bounce back. Being resilient doesn't mean you didn't struggle. It means when you did struggle, you knew where to recalibrate to, where to go back to. That's why, you know, I mean, beyond – talking about resiliency, I love speaking about spiritual resiliency because I think the most uh, most fundamental pillar of resiliency is spiritual uh, resiliency because yeah. when you have that spiritual foundation and you have seen people with and we've seen people without, when you have that spiritual foundation, and then when you endure life's hardships, it's, it, we find people with spiritual resiliency and a strong spiritual foundation able to endure a lot more difficult things uh, in life and those who do still struggle have a much better ability to bounce back uh, right. when they have a strong spiritual foundation. Uh, so, okay, so that leads into one of our questions here, and uh, it's, it's similar, but we can build on it. How does faith impact recovery? We call ourselves a uh, faith-based organization. That means different things to different people, of course. But we really do separate ourselves from clinical programs, which would be, uh, more, you know, psychological or those types of therapies, maybe medical in terms of medication and other things. Um, we're not that. We're not against that, but we're not that. We are a faith-based program, meaning we approach trauma and trial and, you know, life's obstacles and the brokenness from a position of faith. So the question is, how does faith impact recovery? I think this is something a lot of people um, are confused about. Not, why should I be a Christian? Not, you know, those questions. But how specifically does faith impact recovery? So I have fallen on my face. Uh, I am hurt. How does faith 
get me back to the place I need to be? The first thing I'll say before I answer your question is I'll go back to the fact that you said uh, we're not against clinical, we're not against uh, medication. Uh, those, place, those things do have a place. I believe in your recovery plan, if the only thing in your recovery plan is medication, then it's a bad plan. Right. Uh, there have to be other things on top of that. And of those other things, what I've witnessed in the 10 years of doing this, including my own personal story, and in 10 years of helping other people, what I've seen of those other things, the most effective has been uh, faith-based solutions. And, and so to answer your question of what we mean by faith-based solutions, uh, for me, it's, it's believing in something bigger than yourself yeah and and uh and having a set of uh principles to align to um you and i are both christians uh we believe the, the christian bible the holy bible is the blueprint the blueprint for a living and so for me when i begin to uh move into a relationship with christ and cal- i would say calibrate my life to the life i believe I've cr- i was created to live my problems didn't go away my hardships my past didn't go away i didn't go back and erase the bad things that happened in my life but what i was able to do is as i face these problems as i face these moments of anxiety depression i i I had a model in which to make decisions off of in which to and i had principles in which to align my life to and by intentionally doing that my life ended up in a in a better place because those i was making better decisions and, um, you know, that's getting out of sight of the spiritual, the spiritual realm of, of that. Just the, I'm just talking about the kind of meat and potatoes decision making that comes off of living out and actually living out a life of faith. Right. And the difference it makes to someone trying to overcome trauma. Yeah, that's good. Um, you know, we talk about the, the clinical versus the faith based. I always describe it as a clinician, someone in the medical community, uh, you know, in the clinical community would say, well, we need to start with medication, we need to start with therapies, and then work from there. And if there are other tools that are helpful along the way, we can add them. And maybe one of those tools is faith. We would go the other direction. We would say, you need to start with faith, and there are probably other tools along the way that might be helpful, but the foundation has to be faith. It's, it's all about starting point to me. And I think, you know, as you mentioned, if you start with medication, then what's what's the end point? Where do you go? From, where do you go from there? That's the, that's the whole game, right? Um, and so it really is about a starting point. And we start from faith and say, you need to have this first. Because if you don't have that foundation, I had this conversation with someone recently uh, who had been a firefighter and was not a Christian during his time in the fire service, uh, came to a critical moment where he tried to take his life, came into a relationship with Christ. And we were talking about framing and context. Um, if you're not a person of faith, you know, even broadly, there's no context to process the things that you're going through. So you see a tragedy, you encounter something difficult, your relationship isn't right, whatever it is, if you don't believe there's something transcendent, something bigger than you and your situation, uh, why would you not fall into despair and, and, and uh, that darkness that overcomes so many people? You don't have anything else. It's the context that comes from knowing there is a God, He does have a plan, his plan is personal for me. He has a path that he wants me to follow. What I'm dealing with is not all there is. I'm not hopeless because there's something outside of myself. And Frankly, I, I don't know how anybody can function in the world as it is today right. without, yeah. without understanding that we have a God that's in control yeah. of everything. I mean. And that's exactly right. I, and I, I think when you talk about you know, how does faith impact recovery, uh, well, it gives you a perspective that allows you to see the world where you're not the center of it. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm not the center of the world. God is. Um, I'm not. And since I'm not, then my frailties and my uh, my failings and my issues are not all there is. There's something much bigger and much more. Um, I say something. God is bigger. He is in control and he has a plan. Yeah, I don't know how you go through the world the way it is and look around and go, well, there's no God. I think another thing, when you're in despair and I've, you know, I was- spent many, many years of my life in despair, uh, without God, you feel like your, your, uh, your life, your future, your sanity, like everything's in your hands. Right. And, uh, and and it's, it's up to you for it to make or break it. And, uh, and deep down when we're in those moments, we don't feel capable. And so just, uh, to come to the understanding that my life, my, my, 
my sanity, my health, my eternity is not in my hands. It's in, it's in God's hands, which is a much better place than in my own hands. Yeah. Uh, there's just such a peace and comfort that comes from, from the, that, that revelation in someone's life. Yeah. It's crazy because the most capable person, we say this in one of our classes during the program that uh, everyone is, is insecure inside or every man is insecure. I forget exactly how the quote yeah. goes. Um, but it's true. You look at the person that seems the most capable on the inside. They know who they are and yeah. they know where their insecurities are. They know the things that they're afraid of, the things they're, they're hiding from people. And if I have to be in control of everything, I'm only as good as who I am. And, and I know the truth. I know I can't control my relationships and I can't control what's happening in the world. And, and uh, faith really is exactly as you described it. It's understanding. I don't have to be in control. You know, God has a plan and it's bigger than me. And there's a, a tremendous amount of peace and comfort that comes from that. And that, that's, that's, when we talk about something like PTSD or, or panic disorder, anxiety, that's, that knowledge is, is healing in itself. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's the, the transcendence of God is, um, man, probably the most comforting thing we have is, is knowing he's bigger, than, <laughs> he's bigger than all this. He's not worried about it. Um, so next question, kind of on the faith, not kind of, on the faith topic as well. Um, I'm of another faith, and I, I guess that would mean, I'm, or I assume that means I'm not a Christian like you. Um, I'm of another faith. Will this program work for me? And that's an interesting question because we've been answering that one for like 10 years. <laughs> um, I don't believe what you believe. Is there anything in this program for me? How would you address that? Uh, well, if, I get, if I'm going to answer it candidly, I'd be like, if, if, you're, if what you believe is working, then why are you coming to our, our program? Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, if what you, it goes to the Mighty Oaks question, right? If what you're doing isn't working, then why not try something different? Uh, you know, if, if, if you're still missing something and you're searching, then what, what do you have to gain? Uh, everything. Yeah. You have everything to gain and, no, and nothing to lose. I'd say, uh, why not come and, and give it a try? Uh, listen to what the, the, personal testimonies of the leadership who's been through, uh, been through some of the hardest things you can imagine in life and transcended those things through their life of faith. And, uh, and, you know, attempt to see what, you know, to peel back the curtain behind, you know, the, the biblical truths that as we would present them yeah. and, and see and really contrast your life to what your life would be like if you align those, align your life to those things. You know, um, I, 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 uh, I know this, People have all kind of beliefs and faiths out there. Uh, I, I believe that uh, the the Christian life is 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 the truth. I believe this. I I also believe that it's much different. Uh, I thought. I think for a long time I thought all faiths were kind of the same, and I thought we just believed different things because the way we were raised. And then as I really got into the study of apologetics and understanding why I believe what I believe, I just believe the Christian life is just so different than any other faith. And, uh, and it's different because of its, you know, it's truth. It's truth. Yeah, right. Yeah, I it's... Explain that right or too Yeah, harsh. no, it's, <laughs> it is. So, so I think this, this breaks down into two parts. Uh, one is just faith broadly. And uh, a lot of research has been done on this. And there are studies that would say just believing in something. You even go back to, um, you know, some of the uh, drug and alcohol programs that talk about faith or belief. The object is unimportant. You have to believe in something bigger than yourself or outside of yourself. And right. a lot of research has been done that that I is higher help. power. Yeah, it's I a higher power, power or, you know, your higher power can be a rock or <laughs> whatever. But it, that faith aspect, believing in something outside of yourself, um, has been proven to be helpful. I mean, there's a lot of research on that. And that's a key component to getting out of a difficult uh, place in your life. Um, so, Faith by itself can be helpful would, in moving forward. I mean, I was going to say, like, I mean, Vodi Bakum talks about this. His mom was a alcoholic, and she turned to Buddhism, and her, her life was radically changed. Right. I mean, uh, I mean, so we see people of all kinds of faiths have their lives change. But we're talking about it. When we talk about the Christian faith, we're talking about a significantly different change. Right. And and I, I would argue that um, – the major change or the major difference is um, if you're looking for behavior modification, right? there are a lot of things that you can do to modify your behavior. 
and faith is something you can use as a you know a way to do that or uh, a lot of other things but what we're talking about is not behavior modification it's a true aligning to the person you were created by god uh, specific to specifically to be not a general god but god the creator god uh, whose son jesus christ is part of the trinity who came to earth who lived perfect who died on the cross who rose again and i think the thing that separates christianity from all other religions is the resurrection. It's, it's about a Savior who died in our place, but then rose again. And there were witnesses that observed that happening and all the things we could talk about there. Um, but religions, apart from you know biblical Christianity, it's all about me. I need to do something to gain God's favor. Biblical Christianity helps us to understand it has nothing to do with you. It's all about what God has done through Christ. And so... I think that's the difference. The difference is, uh, will your faith help you? Yeah, probably. Um, Will it make you a better person? Maybe. Maybe even more moral, maybe a better husband or whatever. I mean, maybe. Um, But when we're talking about eternity and soul level renewal and regeneration, um, that's, that's the difference between what we consider faith and what many others would say, you know, faith is just this general belief in something bigger. Um, and I, I think that's very significant. However, and you mentioned this, um, you don't have to believe the way that we believe to attend our program. And if you believe something else, you know, you're know you not going to be disqualified. I think a lot of people have come, I know, a lot of people have come a lot of people, yeah. to a program who said, I either don't believe in God, um, or I believe in Him, but I hate Him, or I am of a completely different faith than you, or whatever. And all we ask is exactly what you said. Um, that's fine. Believe whatever you want to. Just take some time this week to contrast the way that you live and what you believe with what we're talking about and what we're teaching and what we're trying to model through our own lives and uh, see if there's a difference. And if there's a difference, um, at least be open to responding to to that difference. And we've had had everyone. We've had Wiccans. We've had Buddhists. We had Buddhists. We had had Muslims. uh, We've had uh, a Satanist. who was the elder in the right. church of Satan? Uh, we've had all kind, of, all kind of folk, different folks come through. So yeah, and, and I think the Satanist, in fairness to the Satanists, he said, "I do believe what you guys believe. I'm just another team." I'm just- <laughs> <laughs> but but, uh, but the in good fairness. news for those, say, the good yeah, he's like, "I do believe what you guys believe. I believe the same thing. I'm just another team." But at the end of the week, uh, pretty awesome. He yeah. actually ended up getting baptized, which was super cool. Yeah, the uh, the the fallacy of that initial statement was was quickly seen. Uh, I think even for him, which is awesome. And I think one of the things that helps us to allow people to contrast their lives and their beliefs with what we're talking about is the fact that everyone who's teaching, everyone who's a part of what we do at a program like that, um, has probably come from a similar place. Certainly, a place of doubt and a place of um, you know, trauma and brokenness and hurt, and and they've had to go through the same process of of looking and contrasting and making decisions, and now they're just trying to share that transparently with the people that are sitting there and listening to them, which is um, so powerful. It's not a it's not a Sunday school class. It's not you know a preacher teaching down. It's it's me saying I've been there. I know what you're talking about. I've had to make these same decisions, and here are the conclusions that I've come to. Yeah. Yep. Um. When we do this, we do this as a, uh, a men's program and a women's program. So, you know, for those who aren't familiar, <clears throat> we have, when we talk about a program, uh, we're talking about a week-long session where the students will come to one of the facilities that we have across the country, and uh, we pay the cost of the program, we pay the cost of travel, we want to remove any obstacles. Uh, veterans, active duty service members, first responders, and their spouses are all welcome to be a part of our program. And uh, it's about five days at one of those locations. They come and spend time with us. One of the things that we do that may be a little bit unique to us is um, we break those sessions into men's sessions or programs and women's sessions or programs. And uh, uh, it's funny, when we started doing this, no one really questioned that, Uh, but you know, 2021, now everyone's questioning why we wouldn't just put everyone in the same room at the same time, and and uh, uh, there's a very real reason for it. It just doesn't work. But uh, <laughs> men's and women's programs, can you talk about the genesis of that a little bit and why we prefer to do it that way? Well, I mean, uh, from a biblical standpoint, we're 
we're asking our students that are going through our program to make decisions to align their life to the life they were created to live. Right. Uh, you know, we always say we believe that uh, men and women are created equal, but they're created very different. We have different roles in this world. We have different roles in relationships and marriages. We have different roles in parenting. We have different, just there's just differences in men and women. Right. And so it's important that we able to separate those two genders and be able to uh, specifically uh, help them align their lives to the roles in which uh, the, the way God intended. And uh, so that's, that's the way we've done it. We have a, uh, we have a lot of the women's program tends to have a lot of spouses, but it also has active duty female veteran, uh, active duty female service members and uh, female veterans. And uh, and if we have a male spouse, then we would bring them into the men's program. Right. So that's the way we've we've handled it in the past. It's funny we we used to say, um, you know, I, I used to joke when I teach this class about the differences between men and women that I think we all understand there's a difference between a man and a woman, and then everyone would kind of laugh. Uh, we're living at a weird time where people just are afraid to acknowledge that, and hopefully not everyone's afraid to acknowledge it, but men and women are not the same. It doesn't matter what uh, you know the mainstream media tries to tell us. We're, we're wired different, we think different, we respond different, um, and men are much more willing to be transparent in another group of, in a group of men than they are in a setting where there are women present. And I think women are the, are the exact same way. Yeah, I mean, uh, the men are gonna talk about issues that are common common that men face with other men and that women may not understand. I mean, it's same, it's, uh, same sex struggles uh, that, that we deal with that, you know, quite frankly, could be embarrassing or humiliating to say right. in, front of a, in front of women. You yeah. uh, know, that, that would really, uh, that would really compromise the transparency that is needed in a program like ours. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it's important to, you know, acknowledge as well what some of these folks are dealing with. We, we talk about trauma and I think a lot of people think that all that we deal with is trauma related to service. So, you, you know, for the military, it's combat. For the first responders, it's, you know, something they dealt with as a police officer or firefighter or something. Um, but so often what we are dealing with is trauma related to life even before the military or before their time in law enforcement, things like abuse and, um, you know, relationship issues and substance issues and so many other things that uh, if there is not a safe, transparent environment, the student will never deal with those things. It's crazy the things the men have dealt with that they're willing to share in that setting. They would not with women around. And then per particularly with the sexual violence stuff and traumas, yeah. uh, so women would not deal with those if there were men there. Childhood sexual trauma. Yep. Uh, you know, or, or these, some of these women, have, you know, sexual trauma from their, their service. Yeah. Uh, which is, you know, as, as I begin to understand and learn more about that through a program, it's, you know, it's pretty disgusting to know that that many women, uh, and, and just hurtful to know that many women deal with you know, service while they're trying to serve our country, you know, being vulnerable females in a predominantly male environment being taken advantage of us, particularly by people with rank. And right. So they need a comfortable place that they can talk about those things. Men, uh, for the first time in their life, tough, combat hardened men, like the warriors that you would never think, talking about childhood sexual trauma for the first time in their life. Yeah. Uh, the environment that they feel comfortable to be able to talk about something like that. We were able to create that environment. And one of the ways we're able to create that environment is you know, having a men's program and a women's program. Yeah. Yeah, and we've seen uh, seen just tremendous success there, which is which is awesome. Uh, it, it's interesting because you know we cover those basically three groups, four groups with the spouses, I guess. And so then people will ask, okay, well you have a men's program and you have a women's program. Why don't you have a separate program for um, first responders or you know spouses? <laughs> Break it down into all of these things. And and in addition to having a program for men and a program for women. We've also learned that the real core issue is that men need to be men, service aside, what they've experienced aside, and women need to, to be women because that's what God created us to be. And really that's the goal is to be uniquely what God created us to be, even though we've done other things in our lives. Yeah, Mighty Oaks isn't about uh, us helping you be the best we can at your particular occupation. Uh, it doesn't, yeah. you know, what, what your occupation is, whether it's a, a housewife or, or a 
or a Navy SEAL like is is irrelevant to the the type of work that we're doing at Mighty Oaks. We're looking at who you are as an individual, or you or you living your life the way God intended and being the man or woman God created you to be. And if not, then let's help you align your life that way because yeah. you you're going to be able to transcend your hardships by doing so. One of the questions here is. Um, is there anyone who you'd recommend not attend a program? Uh, again, I think that's an interesting question, but is there anyone that you'd recommend not attend a program? Someone that this is not going to benefit them? Uh, I wouldn't say uh, anyone not, but there's some people that there's certain things they should do before they come. Uh, we're not a detox program. Right. So if you're trying to, if you're made a radical decision in your life that you're, you know, I'm on methamphetamines and I want to get off and I want to get my life right. Well, we want to, we want you to be able to come to Mighty Oaks and get, and us help out to help you get your life right. But you probably need to stop first. Not probably, you need to stop first and detox, get, get that out of your, that, you know, get that chemically under control and uh, be in a position where you can make those decisions. Um, if you're dealing with things like we, we've, I think, think some of the toughest things we dealt with is some people who didn't have a, a bipolar condition under control. Uh, they were, you know, and, and so, you know, if we're not, you know, there is a need for medical professionals to help people like that. And, uh, and I think you have to be just in a, in, in a stable place, whether it's a chemical addiction or like some kind of severe medical condition, uh, to be healthy and be able to make sound judgments because we're going to be asking you to make some big decisions yeah. in your life. So I think just people like that. I don't think there's anyone that should never come, but there's uh, definitely a certain, uh, certainly a right time to come. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. No, that's good. I, I have been asked, you know, several times, um, my military service didn't end well. Maybe I got out prematurely or, or whatever. Um, am I disqualified? And the answer for us would be no, we want you to have served, you need to understand the context that we're coming from, or on the first responder side, the same thing. Um, but I, I don't know that I've seen an application yet that was honest that I said, "Wow, this yeah. guy, we're not having them having them come." I think we want to help anyone who who needs to be helped. Yeah, we've we've taken people with dishonorable discharges, and uh, and we will. Uh, one th one thing we, when you talk about being honest, though, that we need is we need people to to be honest. To be honest, in because, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, we've had people apply and put some crazy things on their application and uh, that we clearly know was, was not true. And they, so they're coming in behind this, you know, yeah. we're wearing this mask right away. And, you know, when you're dealing with the program that really needs to get to quickly get to uh, a transparent part of uh, level of your life to be able to make, help you make the right decisions and we'll work, you, you're working against this right away. So, yeah. Yeah. We'll do whatever we can to help uh, anyone that is, is uh, transparent and honest, which again leads to another question. So we're just working through these even without me asking them, is how do I best prepare to get the most out of a legacy program? And I think you just mentioned the first one is you need to come uh, with a mindset that you're going to be honest. <laughs> uh, I think you need to come with a mindset that you're going to be open to what's said, understanding this is not six months long, this is, this is five days. And really when you boil it all down, it's even a little bit shorter than that the time on the front and the time on the back and all of that. It's a short period of time. It doesn't cost you anything. So be open to what's being said and don't come with an argumentative spirit. Um, we have done this for a long time now and it seems like there's always someone who wants to tell us how we should be doing it. And, and I think most of the time, and criticism's fine, but, but most of the time when someone is coming as a student and they want to tell us how we should be doing it, what they're actually doing is deflecting from their own issues and responsibility to deal with those issues and try to focus on something else. They're there to deal with whatever it is they're dealing with. And I think coming with an openness to that is really important. Uh, what else yeah. should someone do to prepare to get the most out of the program? I think, I think just, I mean, get as many distractions off the table as possible. Uh, you know, if you can, if you can stay away from your phone while you're there, your computer, that's the most, uh, I think those are important things, but just being open-minded is the most important thing. Yeah and come ready to change like we we as great as our program is we have an incredible staff we cannot help anyone that does not want help right uh, and so you have to be ready and willing and want to change yes uh, you have to have a desire to change yeah it's amazing how many people show up and you know for whatever reason that's not why they're there 
Um, but if they can get into that mindset, change will happen. And they may not even agree with everything we say by the end of the week, but they'll have a different perspective on what they're going through. And I think that's really, really important. Um, yeah, get, get all the distractions out of the way. There's even stuff at home you should probably deal with. I think if you know, you've got a big project going on or there's some unresolved thing at home, deal with that before you come so you're not dealing with it while you're, while you're there. Um, but at the same time, don't, don't use that as an excuse to put off coming. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I'll be like, well, I go, but I really have to get this squared away first. This, you know, I mean, sometimes you just need to, you just need to go. You so it's probably more, it's probably more put it out of your mind and just don't try to deal with it while you're gone um, yeah. and yeah. get to where you need to go. Yeah, that's right. Um, Cause, because we'll, we'll, we'll all use that excuses like that. Well, I got to get this squared away first, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Just put it aside and, and deal with it when you get home. If, uh, if that's going to prevent you from coming, that's right. Um, you mentioned the chemical dependency issue. Um, again, that's another question we get quite a bit. I have a chemical dependency. I'm an alcoholic or you know drug addict. I'm dealing with these things. Can I attend your program? The short answer is yes. <laughs> um, but the longer answer is we're not a detox program or um, you know a rehabilitation program. So let us help you. And we know a lot of folks. We've got a lot of connections. Let us help you get to a place where you can deal with that so that yeah. you can then come to the program and get the most out of it uh, that you possibly can. A clear and clear and sober mind. And, and uh, you know, also it's a safety issue. If you're legitimately think you're going to be, you're going to detox, you know, our, our locations, we're, we're in yeah. our four ranches that we use are re remote locations. Right. So we're not running like, you know, five miles down the road to the, to the ER. If we have, if you have a, a detox sure. emergency, you're probably having to get on a helicopter. Like, it's a big deal. So right, yeah. Do yourself a favor, but but like you said a minute ago, don't let your chemical dependency keep you from coming. Um, reach out to us, fill out the application on our website, and let us know that that's something you're dealing with, and we'll do our best to connect you. Uh, we've been blessed with a lot of great partners that, I mean, have really helped with this, and yeah. uh, we can get you to a place where you can deal with that, so that you can then deal with this as a kind of a phase two. That's right. Um, Man, a bunch of other questions. Um, I'll ask this one. When you look at Mighty Oaks, um, what makes Mighty Oaks different? Uh, again, this is a, a question people ask because there are a lot of programs. Uh, I think the number is 44,000 or something. Veterans programs, veteran service organizations, people that deal with veterans, and that would be you know all kinds of stuff. But there's no shortage of veterans programs. So what makes Mighty Oaks different? How does Mighty Oaks stand out in a, in a crowd that's that crowded? I'll say, I'll say two, two, two things. There's not one thing alone. Uh, and this may sound like a very Christian word to some people that aren't Christians, but it's, it's an, an anointed program, uh, meaning God's hand is on the program. Uh, I could say that from being a leader of the organization, that what has happened in the organization that we have and the, the program that we do uh, is a miraculous series of events. Um, no one person, no team of people are, are capable of doing what happens at Mighty Oaks. Um, and so I believe it's, you know, it's a God anointed program and God's hands over it. And some things happen that there that I still to this day, after 10 years of being around it, just cannot explain. Uh, so I'd say that's one thing. And the second thing is that we're peer to peer. Yeah. Uh, and that's a very important thing. Uh, all of our leadership in the organization or you don't have to be a combat veteran to go to the program, but all of our leadership and organization currently has served in, in combat. Uh, and they have come through a Mighty Oaks program and they went through our leadership called, we call it a phase leadership program and been discipled to in our methodology to be able to run our programs. And so what's different uh, that really resonates with veterans is that they're not dealing with a clinician who has a, a degree, read it in a book, which is nothing wrong. You know, clinicians have a certain a great role and a, right. a very, a very effective in some cases, but for us, what we do, it's a peer to peer. Uh, so we're able to come from a position of experience uh, and personal testimony and say, Hey, I've been here before. Yeah. I've, I may not have a, the same ex exact experience as you, but I've, I've, I've been where you are. I've struggled and I found a way forward. Let yeah. me show you how. Yeah, it's great. I, I, I would say definitely that the two things if someone, um, if I was having that conversation is, you know, it's God anointed for sure. Um, I think, you know, beyond that, I would say two other things. One is just the faith perspective. We try to view all of this trauma and trials and life obstacles and all the difficulties 
uh, from a faith perspective. And so that makes us unique. I mean, when you take the field of 44,000 organizations and then you say which ones view what veterans are dealing with from a position of faith, eh, it gets pretty small at that, po- <laughs> at that point. And I don't know what that number is, but it's a pretty small number. Um, yeah. And then, you know, the second thing I would say is beyond that, uh, we're not providing services to veterans and active duty service members. We're providing, you know, faith-based help to get beyond the traumas and the other issues of life that you're dealing with. I think a lot of um, programs, so-called, are dealing specifically with things like addiction and those those issues. Um, and then you have other, you know, organizations that that provide trips and do all kinds of stuff. It's good stuff. But we're really trying to meet you at your point of need, um, your point of brokenness, your point of hurt, your point of trauma, and guide you forward using the experiences of our lives as God has worked in our lives to do the same for us. And uh, I think that makes us very unique. I'd say mentoring forward. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the other thing that I'd say is unique about Mighty Oaks, and uh, we do our best we can at it. We It's a two-way relationship, so we can't always it's not completely in our control, it's in your control, let's say your, meaning the student as well, uh, is, is aftercare. Um, you know, just go to a, a lot of programs, you go to the program and then you finish the program and, yeah. and that's it. Uh, we do, a, we, we put a tremendous amount of effort into aftercare and making sure that we are there to provide uh, continued mentorship, growth, uh, guidance, counsel uh, for you after the program. Yeah. And, uh, and I can tell you, like, like I said, just being honest here, uh, that doesn't always work out well because <laughs> It requires two, and, but for the ones who choose to stay connected into the Mighty Oaks network and, and tied into our aftercare mentors uh, and, uh, and our, our process and our, you know, our aftercare network, uh, it, it's a very successful, um, the aftercare program is very successful. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Aftercare is a, is a big part of what we do. Um, and over the years, we put more and more emphasis on that. We do our best to connect graduates to a community of people, whether it's a church or something at home, that they can be connected to, so important for success. But then even beyond that, yeah, um, counselors and, and all the other resources that folks need, which is, um, yeah, so important. And very thankful for our aftercare folks and, and uh, other organizations that have come alongside of us. Um, uh, other things we could talk about, but I'll shift gears here as we uh, start to come in kind of for a landing. Um, and for those of you that are listening or watching, again, take some time and ask questions. We'd love to answer those and we'll get those on a list for the future. Um, but a lot of things are upcoming and um, a lot of what we focus on, you know, when we're not doing programs and particularly, specifically, you and I, is outreach events and, you know, just a lot of other stuff that people may not know is going on. Um, we pay for every student to attend the program. We pay for all the cost of travel to attend the program. Um, and I say we, it's really not we, it's the donors, it's the, you know, the thousands of people that have come alongside of us and uh, provided financial resources. What's that? That's a grateful nation. It's people. a grateful nation. It's, it's people that understand something needs to be done and, and uh, they want to do that. And so thankfully they've entrusted us and we try to steward over those resources to make that happen. Um, for you know those who need to attend. But outreach is a big part of that, and we've got some big outreach events coming up. Um, one in particular that uh, I know uh, we're all excited about, but I know you're super excited, <laughs> excited about. Uh, you wanna talk about uh, this big outreach opportunity that's coming up for us? Yeah, we, uh, Mighty Oaks has uh, been part of producing a documentary uh, about uh, the story of Mighty Oaks, um, the story of several warriors, including my own story, uh, Brandon Kunith, Luis Rivera, uh, Erica Kelly. Yeah. Um, our stories uh, of, of hardship, of trauma, of why we started Mighty Oaks, what we do at Mighty Oaks, the transformational uh, process of Mighty Oaks, and just the, the incredible story, again, the, the incredible story of Mighty Oaks. So we just captured a documentary. We have some great, uh, great uh, people in there speaking into it. Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, Sergeant Major Carlton Kent, Major General Bob Dees, uh, just incredible people speaking yeah. into it. We talk a lot about the programming in it. And so we, uh, we, we produced it. We partnered with I Am Second, who's a, I Am Second, who's an incredible uh, producer of, of, of testimonial content. Uh, so they're, they're we do it in association with them. We're going to premiere it in partnership with the Museum of the Bible at the Museum of the Bible. It's crazy. On the 27th, uh, Mr. Steve Green, who's the president of 
Hobby Lobby and chairman of the Museum of the Bible is going to be hosting the event. It's a, a private event. Um, you know, we, do, we, you know, if you're if you're listening, you are interested. Uh, it is a possibility to attend. You just have to contact us to see if we have avail, uh, available slots to attend. But it's going to be just an, an incredible night to where we're going to premiere it, uh, and we're going to do a, a panel Q and A, and then after that, I am Second is going to do a 45 day exclusive release on it and show it on all their platforms and then a global digital uh, distributor uh, distribute global digital distributors is going distri to distribute it to all of these streaming platforms so to make it available everywhere and uh, and the reason we're doing all this is uh, for outreach we want uh, every warrior uh, who is is serving or has served and their spouses and families to know that there is hope there is a solution to their hardships that they're facing uh, through the military service and uh, and and Mighty Oaks is able to provide that for them. Yeah, one of the things that, um, so this documentary has taken two years to produce, something like that. And uh, one of the reasons it's taken so long is because we've, we've worked so hard um, on dialing in the message. <laughs> because it, it, you know, we talked about this a long time ago, we don't want this to be a long form commercial for Mighty Oaks, and that's not what it is. It really is a, a, a documentary that gives it provides stories, it gives hope, it gives direction. And if you're interested in Mighty Oaks and what we do, uh, this is for you. If you're struggling um, and you don't know what to do next, this is for you. If you know someone that's struggling, uh, this is for you. It, it's, man, it's so well done. And uh, we've had some great partners, as you mentioned, come along. But um, I, I love the tone of it because it tells stories, again, that are helpful and uh, not just informative. It's not a commercial. And I think that's really important. It's going to be powerful. Uh, I'm excited about it. And one of the things that took us again so long is because we didn't just want to make it and then put it up on YouTube. Right. We wanted to make sure it had far reaching uh, distribution because we wanted to be able to reach uh, as many people as, uh, as we can because we know that, you know, man, when men and women get out of the military, they go home to their communities and they're sometimes they're hard to reach. Yeah. So we wanted to have as far, far wide of a net as we could cast. And we'll make sure that on our platforms, if you're not following us on social media, you need to follow us on Facebook or uh, uh, I guess any of the others as well. Facebook is, is where a lot of our information comes out, Instagram as well. But uh, we'll push that out when the documentary is available for public viewing, of course. We've got a trailer that we're going to push out. And uh, as Chad mentioned, it's a private event, but if you're interested in attending, let us know. Uh, you can email us, info, info at mightyoaksprograms.org. Let us know you're interested in the documentary. And uh, we'll see what we can do. A lot of a uh, lot of things still being worked out now, but excited about that. Um, other outreach events that we do, as Chad mentioned, are the speaking events, and all of those come with uh, with content. We've written books, and we do shows like this, and we do other content that we provide. And uh, I think one of the things that makes us unique, going back to a question earlier, is that we provide all of this content. We pay for the content, and we push it out there because we want everyone. Uh, who needs it to get it. Um, if we charge anything, uh, it's because we need to cover the cost of producing it. But if you need something that we have that we may charge for and you can't afford it, um, you know, we've done this thousands of times. Um, people will let us know, we'll make sure they have the resources they need. And I think that's a really important aspect of what Mighty Oaks does, is provides resources to people that may not ever attend a program. That's right, yeah, I mean, we, we've said that early on. We, not, we know not everyone about to make it to a legacy program. And so we want to make sure that uh, the message of hope and restoration and, uh, and, and to help, help enable people to live God's purpose in their lives is, uh, is, is spread to as many people as we can. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm pretty proud of us as an organization that we've been able to do that. Yeah, that's awesome. It's great. Well, Chad, thank you for this. Um, we'll, uh, we'll do this again, I'm sure. And uh, again, for those of you that are listening or watching, and hopefully you are watching, if you're listening, go watch. You can find us on YouTube. And again, tons of content there. Um, but if you're interested in the Mighty Oaks Foundation and what we do, please go to our website, Mighty Oaks Programs. Dot org. Mighty Oaks, that's with an S, programs, also with an S, uh, mightyoaksprograms.org. You can find out everything there is to know about us, uh, links to all of our other content. If you are interested in attending a program on that website, mightyoaksprograms.org, there is a place to apply. And uh, that's right up there in the menu bar. You can find that application. Fill that out. That will automatically go to our team, and we'll make sure that someone gets back to you very, very quickly. This year alone, uh, we just added a week of programming uh, today. 
Uh, this year alone, we'll have 30 weeks of sessions. Um, you know, we're already into this year, but we will have finished uh, by the end of the year, hopefully 30 weeks of sessions, which means that if you are in need of uh, a program like this, there's a place and there's a time and it's coming up and we'll get you in and uh, we'll work with you to make sure that you're there as quickly uh, as possible. If you have any questions, please let us know. We'd love to uh, connect with you. Again, send an email, info at mightyoaksprograms.org or uh, if you're on YouTube, you can drop it in the comment section. If you have questions that you would like answered on future shows, you know if you listen to this, we often have guests and we talk about all kinds of stuff. Uh, but once in a while, we're going to pull aside, uh, kind of pull off the road a little bit and answer some of these questions. If you have a question that you would like answered, please let us know and uh, we'd love to answer that for you. Again, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you next time.